Hi again, welcome back to the factory. It's me, Haley. Um, we're gonna walk through 105 this time. It's our art video. Learn how to build all of our drinks. Um, so that's the basic start. We're gonna learn about red and green latte art, red and green milk, uh, how to build those drinks. Awesome. Every step along the way, we're gonna learn about how to be urgent and multitask in our work as well. Um, so feel free, take your notes, get ready for the quiz, get ready for the video, or the class, this is nothing new. Um, see you down there. Today we're going to talk about how to make all the drinks. All the drinks. And really before we can do that, we're going to have to talk about the basic steps to building a drink. Um, following a really good workflow and doing things consistently in the same way every time is really going to help us with our urgency to the customer. So there are two very important multitasking steps that we're going to use for every drink. Um, one would be that when I put everything together, I will be dosing my shot while I fill my milk pitcher. And the other one is that while my shot pulls, I'm going to be steaming my milk. So I'll just demonstrate that quickly. Dose my shot while I fill my milk pitcher. bottom of the milk pitcher or the milk gallon should never sit on the counter. Best rule of thumb is to always just pick it up, fill your pitcher, put it right back in the fridge so it doesn't sit out and it doesn't make your counter cluttered or look dirty. So with my milk pitcher filled, tamp my shot. Insert immediately brew. While I do that, I have to steam. So I'll be able to stop my shot. Won't forget about my steam wand. And that was it. Those were my multitasking steps. I was able to dose while filling my milk pitcher and pull my shot while steaming my milk. Great. Oh. That moves us on to the next thing. We need to know how to make a good quality drink. So in order to pour acceptable lattes, I need to always pour green art. Let's talk about what red and green are. Right now, I've got really good quality milk, so ideally I should be able to pour some green art. But I didn't, right? So, green art would be art that is centered in the cup with great microphone and good contrast with a distinct line drawn through to finish it. So this cup is not green because my art is sitting at the very bottom of my cup. I'm also struggling a little bit with contrast, but we'll go on and we'll show you another. So here is another latte that would be red. One thing that might not be that easy to tell in the video is the thickness of my foam. If this is a latte, my bubbles are too big. You can see that just by looking at it like right now. But the thickness is also just too much. This would be ideal for a cappuccino, minus the large bubbles that you can see there. All right, so this would be an example of red art. And on first glance, you might not 100% know why. Well, for one, I didn't pour what I was going to intend to pour, which was a heart. Um, and you can see my milk is really thin. Sometimes it's possible to pour really nice green art and still have thin milk. But only, and mostly just skilled baristas can do this. Um, but it doesn't matter. Either way, that's a red latte, specifically because there is not enough foam there to be a delicious latte. So this would be an example of green latte art. 
You can see here we have really good contrast between the white and the brown, especially around the outside of my heart. It's pretty well centered. Uh, my microfoam is ideal. Let's take a look at what that is. So there isn't too much. I can see it start to break away a little bit toward the bottom, but it's not really full, not too thick, and also not too thin. Um, I've got a really nice draw through in the end to finish my heart off, so I'm not left with just a little monk's head. Um, and all art should follow those basic rules. Great milk quality, so uh, excellent microfoam, just the right amount of foam, centered in the cup, also nice and big, it's taking up a good amount of the surface area, and a final draw through. So we can apply these rules to rosettas and tulips. Um, if you expand your reach in the future to something else, like a swan, you want to make sure that those are really nice and large in the cup, there's good definition, and that they're centered, but there wouldn't really be a finish or a draw through. We're going to be intentional with whatever we're pouring, so that's part of the reason we make sure we have a draw through in the end, is because if we have that draw through, then we finished our art, we intended to pour a heart, we poured a heart. So we use the terms red and green to provide a lot more clarity about what is acceptable and not acceptable. Um, when we're serving customers, we want all of our lattes to be green, ideally. Ideally, we want to do this 100% of the time, but we might serve some red latte art here or there, meaning that we serve something that is off-center or um, has not great contrast, we're still working on our art, uh, and that to be certified, you have to at least reach an 80% green mark before you can serve customers. Only 20% of your lattes can go out that are not green or would be red. When we serve a red latte, it can communicate maybe that we don't really care about what we're doing, but it also communicates that maybe I don't know how to steam my milk really well, so I'm struggling to pour great latte art because I won't get a really good texture of milk for my customer. Great texture is part of the reason that we really enjoy drinking lattes because we have really smooth milk and that makes a latte that much more delicious. So giving them something bubbly and with that microfoam is going to actually be a not that delicious latte in the end, which is why we don't want to serve red. So let's cover how to make some of the smaller beverages, specifically those ones that we really need to use our scales for, because they are going to be a little more espresso forward. Um, first of all, espresso. If a customer orders an espresso for here, there is a particular way that I want, that we want you to serve it, and that you're going to enjoy serving it. So again, we're going to have our scales out. making sure to check the in weight as well as the out weight so that we're dialed in to exactly where we're supposed to be. But for an espresso for here, I'm going to pull my shot directly into the demi -tasse. Why? The reason we do this is actually for presentation. When we serve an espresso for here, we pull the shot directly into the demi -tasse because of the flecking that could occur and the beauty of the surface on the top. So you can see some nice dark marks specifically at the bottom of the cup that we would want to have captured. Um, when I stir this or if I mix it up at all, all of that contrast goes away. It just doesn't look as beautiful as it did before. Another thing to keep in mind when serving espresso is to be sure that you always serve it on a saucer and with a demi spoon. This is the only drink that we serve with a demi spoon and particularly because, as I mentioned before, in our espresso class, customers should have the opportunity to stir their espresso before drinking it in order to incorporate all of the flavors. So it seems a little odd maybe that we would pull a shot directly into a demi tasse and then not stir it, not disturb it, and present it just to have the customer stir it, but there's a reason for everything. If we're pulling a shot to go in a large eight ounce cup, we don't need to worry about that. We don't really get that ability or that opportunity to be 
really beautiful with our presentation. For the macchiato, especially for here, I'm going to pull my shot and decant it into my demi -tasse. And I've steamed enough milk for an eight ounce latte and that's because um, it's really hard to get good milk quality unless if I don't have enough milk to steam. So I'm gonna dump a lot of that out before I pour just to make it easier for me to get good contrast in this cup. So instead of taking my time to really fill the cup like I normally do for latte art, um, because I'm already so close to the surface, I can pretty much just dive in there and go ahead and pour right away. So you can see I didn't take very much time at all to do that, to really get in there and make my heart. And then just like the espresso, I'm gonna serve that on a saucer for the customer. This time, no spoon. So I just poured a cortado. Whenever I pour a cortado, similar to the macchiato, um, I don't have very much time to really like fill the cup before I touch down, um, but there was a little more of an opportunity to do that. So I pretty much dove in there, filled, leveled out, and drew through. Um, here it is. One thing that's really different between this beverage and any other is that it's steamed to a lower temperature. Cortados are meant to be just like thrown back. So 140 degrees is the temperature we want to reach for a cortado. Nothing too hot. So you can tell or you can see that I haven't served this on anything. Our last beverages were served on a saucer. This one is really just beautiful and plenty good, desirable on its own. These glasses are beautiful. We have no reason to put it on anything. And this is even a little more convenient, especially if it's something that's just going to be thrown straight back. I don't need a saucer. Next, we're going to make a cappuccino, a traditional cappuccino, I should say. So traditional cappuccinos are six ounce beverages, and they're a single shot. So one of the things we need to do is make sure that when we pull our shot, we pull it into two separate vessels. Both vessels need to be on the scale, or shot glasses need to be on my scale so that I can catch both of them. And when I stretch my milk, I'm going to stretch it just a little bit more because I want about a third of the volume of my milk to be just foam. While I steam my milk, I'm gonna stretch it just a little bit more, but I'm still gonna have good microphone. The bubbles are gonna be tiny and beautiful, but I'm just gonna have more of them. All right, so I pull both of my shots. I only need one. Pour it into my cappuccino cup. Get a really nice polish. With thicker foam, you usually need to move a little bit faster to really force it to move throughout the cup. Awesome. Not done yet. If I want to serve this properly, it has to be on a saucer. And that is a great cappuccino. Single shot, traditional, six ounces. We can take a quick look at my foam, microfoam, and great thickness. You can see that the thin milk doesn't even really appear below there. Awesome. The last thing we need to discuss is when a customer orders any one of these beverages to go. We don't have anything smaller than an eight ounce cup to serve this in that has a lid. So when we serve an espresso to go, we're gonna just pull shots and pour them directly into this eight ounce cup when we serve it to go. If somebody orders a macchiato and they want that to go, we will pull shots of espresso, pour them in here, and only fill up to a three ounce volume in this cup because that's how big these cups are. If you really wanna know how big that is or how full it is, well, you just go ahead and do this right around here on your cup and that is the proper fill line for a macchiato to go now in this case it's hard to pour really great latte art into the very bottom of a cup that's to go uh, really experienced baristas i've known actually can do it but for our purposes i want to make sure that we just worry about the proper fill line if you serve a customer who orders a macchiato 
a drink that's up to here, that's the wrong drink, and you shouldn't serve that. Concern yourself with greatly steamed microphone, great milk that only goes up to this line. Let's take a look at the fill line for that one. Once again, this time we're going to four ounces for the cortado and that comes up to this line. Same basic rule, I don't care that much about latte art, but I wanna make sure the customer gets the right fill line for their drink. Six ounce cup, eight ounce cup. We are sitting somewhere below this white line, but just below. And again, our milk's gonna be a little bit thicker, but with stellar microfoam. And in this case, you can get art, and I really want you to. So please get some green art on this court cappuccino. Um, just takes a little bit of practice. All right, so the next drinks we wanna cover whew, are quite a few. We have the Americano, the Overdrive, the Olay, the Chai, and the Lavender London Fog. First, the Americano. So an Americano and Overdrive and an Olay all should come to the bar in a sleeve. They all start prepped with some hot liquid inside of them. The Americano has hot water, the Overdrive has hot coffee, and so does the Olay. So beginning with the Americano, we have this water filled up pretty close to the top. Um, it can maybe even go a little higher depending on if the customer wants room for cream. Um, for Americanos, 12 ounces or smaller, receive two shots of espresso, 16 ounces and bigger, four shots of espresso. And I'm gonna weigh my in and my out weight. To verify that this very espresso forward beverage is delicious. So just like smaller drinks, Americanos also need their ins and outs weighed to make sure that we still are serving delicious beverages. So I would pour this onto the top of my water and serve it just like that to the customer. Facing the name of the beverage toward them. And in cases of things like Americanos or things that come with the sleeve on it, we wanna have the name of the customer visible. So please write that up top where they can see it because otherwise it's covered up by the sleeve. That's not great. For an iced Americano, what we're gonna do is have the cup come to the bar prepped with some water. It can be about a third of the way up. And then what we're gonna do is add the espresso and finish filling it with ice all the way to the top. We wanna make sure that we're not just throwing ice or espresso right onto ice. Um, this actually does have an effect on the flavor of the Americano. You can go ahead and try it in cafe if you'd like. I'm gonna add the espresso next to my water. Fill it all the way up to the top with ice. If the customer needs room for cream, this is actually a really good amount of space if they'd like. Next is the overdrive. This is gonna come to you at the bar with coffee already in it. All you need to do is add your perfectly weighed and um, cold shots to the top, just like an Americano, but this time with coffee. And you'll serve it like that. The next one is an Olay, and what's gonna come to you is about a half a cup full of coffee. Okay, you can see in there, there are some little bubbles that are actually gonna get in the way of art. So I take a clean bar spoon, and I can actually scoop those guys out so that my art is not inhibited. It may also help you to stretch your milk a little bit more, add a little bit more foam. Oop. It's okay, but I should be able to get a heart in here. You may only be able to do so much, but with good practice, I've regularly been able to get some nice hearts in there. Um, please work on accomplishing good art in your Olays just like you would anything else. Our next drink is chai. On your cheat sheet with syrup weights, you're gonna have an amount of chai that you wanna add to your pitcher before you add your milk. Um, I'm going to fill my pitcher with the amount of chai. I'm gonna multiply the weight of my chai by three and fill my pitcher up the rest of the way with milk. So if my in weight was 100, 
For chai, the weight of my milk should be 300, or a total of 400 grams. With chai, it's not possible to have any kind of latte art. All I'm doing is getting really great microfoam so that the texture of my final beverage is great, and the temperature is between 145 and 155. So I should have little to no waste, and my cup should be full all the way, and my microphone is actually pretty stellar, you just can't tell. Um, those big bubbles just come from a really fast pour and fill, and that's just fine. The last drink we're going to do is a lavender lemon fog, and it's really easy and really delicious. This cup should come to you with a, a, an Earl Grey tea bag inside of it and the syrup or the lavender syrup. Okay, the lavender syrup weight for the lavender London Fog is the same syrup weight that we use for the lavender latte. So all I need to do to finish this lavender London Fog is add milk, nice hot milk. Um, and when I serve it to the customer, leave the tea bag in and let them know that it'll require a four to five minute steep time. And once that time's up, it's gonna be great to drink. The next two drinks I want to talk about are the hot chocolate and the matcha. For both of these drinks, all we need is syrup in the bottom of our cup and hot steamed milk. So to begin, I'm going to add, I'm going to have syrup at the bottom of my cup, whether that be the matcha syrup or the chocolate or mocha syrup. And I'm going to fill it about halfway up with milk and stir really vigorously so that all the syrup incorporates well with the milk. I'm gonna polish my milk one more time too before I pour. Finish off with green art. Just like I would for a latte. Serving it for here on a saucer. Just like a latte. Now we're going to talk about cleaning and sanitizing our cold brew kegs and taps. Um, so to do that, we have to go on a little trip. So follow me. To clean out our cold brew tappers and keg and lines, we need to use this, which is one, two cold brew. Uh, one side is how we clean, and the other side is how we sanitize. So clean. Step one is actually going to be removing and emptying our cold brew kegs. Taking each of these off, opening up the keg, and emptying it out. Ideally, we're going to do this when the keg is empty, so we don't have to waste any cold brew. Otherwise, we can always place that cold brew inside of a gallon pitcher or anything to house it, a clean thing to house it, while we clean out both kegs and the lines. Once that keg is empty, we're going to rinse it and fill it with four gallons of water. And then we'll take one ounce of the cleaning solution and add it to the water, reconnect the lines, and run all of that water out of both taps into something. And that could be, that's gonna be something just determined already by your cafe coach or your coworker will let you know, whatever it is. And once you're done cleaning the kegs, you're gonna run a rinse cycle through. So one more time, fill up your whole keg with four gallons of just water and run all of the water through it. After the rinse cycle, it's time to sanitize. So take the sanitizer, and one more time, we're gonna use one ounce of sanitizer which this one's really fun, we can see how it works. Just by squeezing a little bit, the sanitizer's coming up through here and filling this up to one ounce. So I will dump that in my four gallons of water and one more time run all of that through my line. So once you're done running all the sanitizer through your lines and emptying it out, um, run about a gallon of water through your lines just to clear it out so that you don't have any kind of chemical flavor possibly left in the lines. Ideally you could air dry it entirely but 
Um, just to be sure, go ahead and throw one gallon of water through to flush the line so that when you do add cold brew again, it'll be delicious and it won't taste like our friends here one and two. When it comes to making cold brew, you're gonna run through this whole process with your cafe coach um, and or whoever's training you to close. You're gonna do it at the same time every night because we wanna make sure that every batch of cold brew gets 15 hours of steep time. So all the directions are on the bag. It's a really simple process. Please go ahead and run through that with your cafe team. However, one thing to keep in mind is when we're taking care of our kegs and our lines, um, kegs need to be sanitized between every, um, every time we refill them. So once a keg is emptied, we're going to rinse it and sanitize it just like we would anything in our cafe. The last thing we need to know how to make properly is tea. We have a really great tea line um, that comes from Rishi, and some of the really important things we want to cover or make sure we're doing in cafe is using proper water temperature and also steep times need to be correct. So there are only so many teas that we can control water temperature for. Specifically, anything that is a green tea or a white tea needs to be brewed to a lower temperature than what comes out of our Fetco. So if you're serving a green tea or a white tea, please pay special attention to directions on the container. All of your cafes should have directions there to fill your decanter or your hot water cup right away with water from the Fetco and then if you need add an ice cube or two. Some of your cafes have guides as to how many ice cubes are actually gonna bring you to proper temperature. Once your water is at that temperature, you can go ahead and add your tea bag. This is a green tea. And then let the customer know what the steep time needs to be. You'll serve that in a decanter. If you're serving it for here with a cup on a saucer and a spoon, that is tea service for here. If it's tea service to go, it would go in a paper cup with a sleeve, and again, you would serve it to the customer. Tea service to go only comes in a 16 ounce cup. All of our tea bags are prepped with two tablespoons of tea, which is the amount that we use for 16 ounces of hot water. So if somebody wants a smaller size, you can just let them know that it might be a little too strong. Um, we serve our teas in 16 ounce cups. Awesome, so that is how we serve all of our drinks. So we talked about red, green, latte art, what the expectations are with that, um, how to build all of our drinks, proper order for those things, how to serve those beverages to customers, um, and cold brew, tea line, there's a lot of information in this class. One more time, there's gonna be another quiz that you're gonna take before you come and learn to actually do this in our lab with an educator. So please take your time, um, run through, rewind, do what you need to do in order to get those answers and be prepared for class when we see you.